welcome to a special virtual edition of the Skeptics Track at DragonCon, where we put the science in science fiction. Hello and welcome to our live feed for the Skept Track at, for DragonCon. Uh, next we have Hans House giving a talk on love, whiskey, and adrenaline, who, which are unexpectedly related. Hans is joining us from Iowa. Hello, Dr. House. Hi. Okay, so <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Um, are we, Feed, can you hear me? It's great to be here. Oh, so wonderful. I hear, I hear you fine, yes. Okay, all right, so tell us how those things are related. All right, well, I'll tell you about the story of Jokichi Takamine. All right, um, and then for advancing slides, I just say, next slide, is that what, you, what you're doing? Okay, perfect, well, hold right there. Um, 1854, Japan, was well, a very important year. That was the year that Commodore William Perry uh, sailed his famous black ships into Yokohama Harbor and negotiated quite literally at gunpoint the opening of Japan for international trade. So it was a very important um, date in Japanese history. Uh, next slide. And um, the in that same year in the town of Takaoka, uh, the hero of our story, Jokichi Takamine, was born. Um, he was then the first generation of uh, Japanese to know a, a open Japan to the outside world, really, because he was born the same year uh, uh, of Commodore Perry's arrival. And next slide. Um, his father was, in fact, a samurai. There's a picture of young uh, Takamine with his father. Um, actually, really was a, a samurai, but he was also a physician. Uh, he was a doctor who taught himself how to read Dutch and he used Dutch um, uh, uh, medical books to, in, his, in his medical practice. So he was literally integrating kind of the, the European um, science and, and, tradition, and the medicine of Japan together. So this is someone who totally bridged those two eras. He was a samurai, um, he was there before Japan, but he was also us using uh, European um, science, which is, which is the point. That's, that's the important next step of our story. Next slide. The Commodore Perry's ships carried more firepower just on those ships than the entire coastal batteries of, of the entire country of Japan at that point. So the Japanese recognized uh, very early on that they were hopelessly outgunned and needed to advance uh, significantly te technologically uh, to compete with, with, with the rest of the world. So they encouraged science. They encouraged science among their, uh, their students, STEM learning. They got scholarships. They sent their, their youth throughout the world um, to, study, to study science and technology in other countries. Uh, next slide. And uh, Takamine was sent to Glasgow. There's a picture I took in Glasgow of, um, of the university there. It's a beautiful place, beautiful uh, museum if you ever get a chance to go. Um, and while he was there, he studied fertilizer, and soil, and fermentation. Now, this is Scotland, and he's studying fermentation. So I'm guessing there was a lot of whiskey involved in that as well. <laughs> Uh, he came back to Japan, share where he knew, he became one of uh, a leading young uh, voice in, in science. And in 1884, next slide, the uh, World's Fair, the World's Cotton Exposition was open in New Orleans. And Takamine was sent there uh, as representative to show off some of the new technology that Japan had and to try to learn from other countries as he's done before. So for the uh, exposition, he rented an apartment in the French Quarter. Next slide. Uh, and he rented this, uh, this apartment from a union officer at Ebenezer Hitch. Now, Captain Hitch had a daughter, Caroline. This is a picture of Caroline here. And sure enough, they started dating. Um, so you can imagine how 
scandalous that this might have been, uh, you have an 18-year-old su blonde Southern Belle, daughter of a Civil War officer, who is dating this exotic foreigner like twice his age as like the person from Japan. So, um, and, and you think that this would be scandalous, but we are talking about New Orleans here, which has a long tradition of, um, say, having more open thoughts about things. And in fact, this relationship was celebrated. You can see in the gossip columns of the newspaper at the time, the New Orleans Picayune, there was actually uh, a comment about it. It says, a very enjoyable fair was given last Thursday at the, at the residence of Captain Hitch by a number of young gentlemen in the complement of charming young ladies. Notwithstanding the inclement weather, the attendance was quite fashionable large. The persons who composed the party were as follows and listed a bunch of people, including Mr. J. Takamine, a distinguished Japanese nobleman uh, now on a mission to the exposition, and a Miss uh, Carrie Hitch. So the, the Picayune describes him as a nobleman. And then another, uh, a couple other articles later on, they describe him as a prince. Now, he, he wasn't a prince. He wasn't really a nobleman either. But um, the point is, that's how he was seen by local community. Um, and uh, they fell in love. Uh, before leaving for home, he got engaged. And he went home to Japan, leaving Caroline there so that he could build his fortune. And he spent a year running the country's patent office. Now, that's really important coming up later. So he knew a fair amount about, about patent law at this point. Next slide. In 1887, Takamine returned to, to, to New Orleans uh, to marry the love of his life, Carolyn. Um, and the Picayune described the wedding as well. A romantic courtship, rich in devotion and constancy, last evening dawn into wedded life on the path of which love's golden radiance will fall and love's dreamy music will fill the scented air around. The spacious parlor was beautifully decorated with flowers and ferns, and from the center of the arch hung a large wedding bell. So uh, again, celebrated in the local um, press, uh, you can imagine this beautiful French Quarter wedding um, and very romantic setting. And Tecumene takes his bride and they set off on their honeymoon. And the first place that he takes her, next slide, is a fertilizer plant in Charleston, South Carolina. So I said he was brilliant. I said he was a great scientist. I never said he was romantic. Um, I don't know exactly what Carolyn thought of this kind of beginning of the marriage, but um, to her credit, she stuck with him. Um, next slide. From there, they went on to Washington, D.C., where he studied U.S. patent law. Again, this becomes really important later. Um, and then uh, finally, next slide, uh, they reach San Francisco, they step on a ship, and they begin their long voyage across the Pacific back to Japan, Caroline leaving her country behind, um, not knowing what's ahead of her. Um, and when they said it, when they, we arrived in Japan, uh, Takamine set about developing his Tokyo Artificial Fertilizer Company, where he's going to produce uh, basically a nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, he studied fertilizer in Scotland. He studied, of course, in, in Charleston and other places. Um, and this was his big um, uh, accomplishment. Now, anyone who's interested in fertilizer must think of the soil must think of microorganisms in the soil. And uh, if you think about the soil, you're probably thinking about koji. Next slide. Um, koji is uh, described as the national fungus of Japan. Uh, next slide. Uh, that's a, um, it's a yeast, it's, a, it's an aspergillus, aspergillus, um, aspergillus arisei. Aspergillus is a, is a really dangerous organism in, in humans and certain causes of infections, but in this case, it's a very helpful organism. Um, next slide. It's used to produce miso, produce sake, uh, any, yogurt, any number of fermented drinks. This is a fermented drink you can buy in Japan today. It's even called koji. And the reason the koji is important is it breaks up that um, the starch into simple sugars for the fermentation process. Next slide. Now, at this point, I want to take a quick step back and explain a little bit of chemistry. Yeast is a critically important uh, organism for producing alcohol, right? 
you take uh, simple sugar, you put yeast, you're gonna get ethanol. If you take grapes and you mash them up, uh, the yeast is gonna turn that, those grapes into wine. If you take apples and you mash them up, the yeast is gonna turn that into cider. If you take grain, corn, wheat, rice, and you mash it up, nothing's gonna happen. Nothing's gonna happen because initially, that um, that uh, that starch in though in the grains the starch the sugars are locked up into long chains into these starch chains and you have to break the starch first for the simple sugars to be released so that the yeast can can do their thing. Next slide, and we'll just we'll just skip the video real quick. Next one again. So what, um, what Takamini was able to do was he was able to isolate the enzyme that Koji is using to break up those starch. That's basically amylase. It's what we have in our spit. In fact, in the original days of sake, what would people would do is they would take rice, they'd put it in their mouth, they'd chew it, and they'd spit it back out again and then ferment it because people were, were, were using their own amylase in their mouth to start that process, to break up those starches into the simple sugars to let the yeast um, get out the simple sugars. So what Takamiya did was he isolated the enzyme that Koji was using, and now it allowed them, uh, he could then produce miso, he could produce other substances, and theoretically he could produce um, ethanol, alcohol drinks, on a truly industrial scale, because now you don't need to have malted barley. Uh, which is usually what, what's what's used. Uh, now you could just you could just have this huge industrial production. So he just needed the opportunity um, for this to happen. Next slide. And uh, in 1890, he received a telegram um, from Carolyn's family back in the United States that a whiskey conglomerate in Illinois wanted to apply his process to the large scale production of whiskey. Uh, things were not going particularly well for the family in Japan. Um, Caroline and Takamine's mother, pictured here, um, were not necessarily getting along particularly well. Uh, and she found it felt like, you know, it was like it was bad enough that America had stolen her son away, but now um, it's stolen her, his heart away in the form of Caroline. Uh, so there was certainly kind of some controversy in the household. Caroline also being a gaijin. Uh, in Japan um, wasn't necessarily fairly, fairly particularly well. So they packed up their, their family again, they packed up their belongings and they set back up across the Pacific, next slide, uh, and arrived in Seattle. And from there took a train to Chicago and then on to Peoria. And that is where we have the next scene in our story. Next slide. So Peoria, between the Civil War and Prohibition, Peoria, Peoria's primary industry was whiskey. It was the whiskey town. Uh, it was the largest purchaser of corn in the entire world at the time. Uh, they produced 185,000 gallons per day of spirits. Um, this actually was a significant source of revenue for the United States in form alcohol tax. So uh, it was actually one of the largest sources of revenue at the time. Uh, next slide. This uh, um, uh, production of whiskey uh, was overseen by a Joseph Greenhut. Um, he produced a number of different types of whiskey and basically bought up um, um, smaller brands. Next slide. Um, he recognized that if he could uh, eliminate the malting process, they take the process of taking malt barley, he figured he could save about 12 to 15 percent on the cost of production. And he really knew exactly like how much he could like milk from each gallon of whiskey. And that's what he was looking for. That's why he needed Takamine. Uh, next slide. Now, he formed what's called the Whiskey Trust. Now, this is the, the Gilded Age. This is the age of uh, Standard Oil and J.P. Morgan, all those people. And Grinhead was the equivalent, but for whiskey. And over time, he bought out 140 other producers, other uh, distillers, um, and closed all but 12, so consolidated all of his power, mostly in, in Peoria. Um, people would sell to him because he offered a good price, because he could outcompete everybody on the price of their product and cost of production. 
Um, sometimes he would resort to extortion and even arson, whereas the mm, nice distillery you have here mm -hmm. uh, would be a shame if something happened to it. <laughs> Next slide. In 1891, um, he sets, uh, Takamine sets up shop in here in what's called the Manhattan Distillery. This is in Peoria. Um, he's put, taking his process for, for the koji, what we call it, his, his enzyme that he named diastase. And he's trying to um, produce the whiskey like, like, like Greenhead wants him to do. The problem with this step is that he's putting a lot of independent distillers as well as the malters out of business if he can be successful. So it is not without controversy that he's trying to, to do this, uh, uh, do this uh, process. Needless to say, things got a little messy at that point, and there was a fire at the Manhattan uh, distillery. The newspaper at the time in Peoria reports, the fire at the Manhattan Malt House early yesterday morning was a most peculiar one, and it was only by sheer luck that other buildings were not destroyed. When Hose uh, Company Number 6 um, got the scene of the fire, it was brazing brilliantly, although confined to a small frame tower. Under favorable circumstances, this could easily have been distinguished. They laid a line of hose, but so great was the distance from the burning building to the nearest hydrant that the hose would not reach, and they had to wait till the next uh, uh, hose company arrived. And then, when the water was turned on, there was no pressure. Hmm. Hmm. And, and unfortunately, the uh, building, although, uh, well, we rebuilt it once, the fire was a great inconvenience to the company who was being fitted for experiments in the manufacture of, quote, Takamine whiskey. Now, what's really interesting about that report is despite that news contemporary newspaper report, to this day, the Peoria Fire Department has no record of that fire. Hmm. hmm. So, uh, next slide. Well, this was a, um, a nice attempt, and unfortunately, um, there was a lot of factors that were pushing, headwinds pushing against Takamine, not, and, and most of all was the federal government, because at this point, um, the Sherman Antitrust Act was passed, and the process, the, the, the whole business model of the Whiskey Trust was basically put into, uh, was, was, was disrupted. And in fact, uh, the Whiskey Trust collapsed and went into receivership, and they broke off the contract with Takamine and stopped the production of the Koji Whiskey, which is what they called it. So I want you to imagine this scene now. So they've picked up again, they moved back to the United States, they've invested themselves in this uh, production in Peoria and things went very badly. And they're sitting in an apartment in Chicago, broke. They're selling off their belongings, they're selling off their art, they're borrowing money from Caroline's family um, to, to keep going. And what are they gonna do next? And this is the classic American story of, you know, um, being in, in ingenuity, having ingenuity, having inventiveness, um, and picking yourself up from the bootstraps. Um, at this point, we're at the end of Act Two for our hero, and the hero's arc is at the at the lowest point. St enter the American Biotech uh, <laughs> Corporation. So, uh, next slide. So um, they get a, 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 a telegram from Park Davis in Detroit. And Park Davis says um, they think that his, uh, his process, his little enzyme, would be a great way of treating indigestion. Next slide. And he produces, they produce this digestive aid, um, Taka Diastase. It's Dr. Takamine's Taka Diastase. You can see the, see the package there. And it's basically the alpha cell of a time. It's a huge hit. Um, next slide. And the, um, uh, the doctors recommend to take a little uh, uh, dose of this after meal to help um, with dyspepsia and, and various things. And it takes off and he becomes wealthy again and everything is going great. Um, and it gets better. Next slide. March 10th. March 10th is a critically important date, date in medical history. March 10th, 1971, I was born. <laughs> but also, March 10th, 1894, these two people, George Oliver and Edward Albert Schaefer at the University of College London, took uh, the extract of the adrenal gland of a dog um, 
and uh, they injected it into a, a live model and they saw a, a huge increase in the blood pressure. And they figured there must be something in the adrenal gland that raises blood pressure. And at this point, the race is on to try to isolate that as a potential medicine. Next slide. In 1897, both John Jacob Abel of John Hopkins University, this is shown on the left, um, uh, tries to do it. He, nam he names the chemical epinephrine, epi from above and nephrine for the, the kidney, so at above the kidney. Um, and the next year, uh, Otto von Firth um, also tries to isolate the same medicine. In both cases, they're unable to isolate the chemical completely. So it's not useful as a, as, as a medication, um, but the, it's out there and people are talking about it. And if they can just figure out a way to produce it, uh, it might be something useful. So in 1900, Park Davis comes back to Takamine, next slide, and says, maybe you could, uh, maybe you could work on this. And they set him up in a lab in New York City. Um, this is the lab he worked in. And they asked him to isolate epinephrine. And he also was having trouble getting a, a pure substance. So he asked for help from Japan and his colleagues um, send a graduate student named Kizo Uninaka. And, and next slide. Now, uh, Takamine, um, as most cases in, in, in stories in medicine, it's not the professor who actually achieves the great breakthrough, it's the graduate student working in the lab. And that's the case with, with, with Unaka. Now, Unaka, um, Unaka, was had some experience working with ephedra. Next slide. So uh, as you can see, the comparison between the two chemical substances, uh, ephedra and epinephrine are quite similar. And their effect in the body is quite similar as well. Ephedra is a natural substance comes from, uh, from a plant. Um, and you can, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's known as ma wang in Chinese medicine. It's been long recognized to be a stimulant. Um, and he's going to work on this to try to, and he's using knowledge of that to try to isolate the epinephrine. Now, I have some experience with this particular drug, uh, ephedra. <laughs> I had a patient in, when I was in residency who uh, drank it or swallowed an entire bottle of ephedra pills. They were basically weight loss uh, pills that were purchased over the counter at a nutritional store. Um, and she has such a massive dose of stimulants in her body that she kept going into what we call torsades to point, which is basically it's a special form of ventricular tachycardia where the heart is like fibrillating and vibrating and, and not moving. And it's treated with shocking. So that's when you see in the, in the movies when someone comes in and they, and they put the paddles on somebody and they shock them, um, they're in that fibrillation. Well, she had this special kind of fibrillation called torsades that lasted for hours and we would go and we'd shock her and she'd go back to normal and then a few minutes later she'd go back into it and we'd shock her again we shocked her 30 times in the process of an er visit kept coming back every single time finally got electrolytes under control finally got her out of the uh, that um recurrent rhythm she got admitted she got better she walked out of the hospital after a long visit in psychiatry so pretty amazing so this is a ephedra, so it's a pretty um, potent stuff, and epinephrine is, is similar. Well, Inaka manages to uh, pull it off. He manages to isolate the drug. Next slide. And Takamini rushes off to the, uh, to the patent office and patents this medicine, which Park Davis decides as a brand name, calls it adrenaline, adrenaline without the E. Um, and that's what you, what's seen here. Uh, adrenaline with the, the the word adrenaline is just kind of a colloquial term that's kind of probably started being used in the 50s or 60s that's referring to like you know with adrenaline surge and that kind of thing but the actual um, brand name for the chemical epinephrine the brand name is adrenaline takamini uh, to patents the process for isolating it but also process he patents the substance itself and this is really important this drug is uh, a basically a miracle drug at the time. It's the only mechanism that a lot of surgical uh, fields at the time had to control hemorrhage by basically injecting uh, epinephrine locally into, into blood vessels or constrict blood vessels. It was critical in obstetrics for postpartum hemorrhage, for bleeding after, for after delivery of babies. Uh, it, of course, is really important for the treatment of asthma. And to this day, 
it remains the primary treatment for anaphylaxis. So this is a drug I use uh, on a daily basis and is absolutely critical uh, for uh, my job and for, and for Angie's job in the, in the emergency department. So they patent the name of the drug. They also patent the, the actual epinephrine substance themselves. Now this gets them sued by Abel and some of the other people because they, they say you can't patent something that's naturally in the body. Next slide. And this went into a court battle for uh, at least four years. Finally um, reached the uh, uh, federal court in, in New York and the great judge learned hand is over, over, uh, over, uh, overseeing the proceedings. He says, I cannot stop without calling attention to the extraordinary condition of the law, which makes it possible for a man without knowledge of even the rudiments of chemistry to pass on questions such as these. He's basically saying, I don't know what the hell this whole chemistry stuff is, but I got to decide what, okay, fine. I guess that's my job. So <laughs> Judge Hand and the federal court decides that yes, it is okay to patent the actual substance of the body. And now Takamine and Park Davis has a patent on epinephrine and every epinephrine sold at this point after that, um, he gets a uh, he gets royalty on. So this makes him fabulously rich. Mm -hmm. That court decision lasted for about a century. Next slide. And in 2014, the Supreme Court of the United States actually overturned that. And they overturned that in this uh, case, which is the Association of Molecular Pathology versus Myriad Genetics. Now, what Myriad Genetics had done was they had discovered the BRCA gene. And the BRCA gene is the gene that uh, is associated with increased risk of breast cancer. And they had a test for this gene. The idea is that women could take a test and then just determine um, their relative genetic risk for future developing breast cancer, which is great for medicine and great for women, but they patented the gene itself. Now, no one anywhere could actually work on that gene without like getting approval or paying royalties to myriad genetics. So pathologists sued and said, we've got to be able to study genes. You can't, you can't you know, patent the human body. Um, and uh, eventually the uh, Supreme Court decided unanimously that in fact they're right, that that's uh, something they can't do. And they overturned that rule that had lasted for 100 years. Okay, next slide, we're almost there, we're almost done. So uh, here's the scene now. So Takamini, he's completed his um, uh, back rise to, to, to wealth again. He's got this uh, diastase, this basically alka cells or stuff. He's got epinephrine, adrenaline. Um, he settles in upstate New York. He builds this like compound of little Japanese homes where he and, and Carolyn live. Um, and he's uh, wealthy and respected and having a great time and a wonderful example of American ingenuity coming from an immigrant. And um, he wanted to do something to give back to the country that made him fabulously rich. And there was a plan in Washington to uh, to try to put some cherry trees to kind of kind of uh, decorate the, the Washington Mall, and and the idea had actually come from Japan. A a, a person in Washington had visited Japan, saw the cherry tree, saw the Sakura uh, cherry trees that, that bloom, bloom every spring, and said that would be really great to have in Washington. And as a diplomatic means, something that's something that that Washington Japan was trying to work on. In fact, the the mayor of Tokyo sent over a bunch of cherry trees as a gift. They turned out to be completely infested and had to be burned because they had they, they had uh, they had a uh, invasive uh, species on them. So they didn't have the, the trees. They didn't have the money for the project. And Takamini steps in, and he donates um, three thousand more trees to this project. Um, and he works on his contact with Tokyo to get a new set of trees that were more clean. Um, next step. Next slide. And to this day. If you go to Washington D.C. and you see the cherry trees around the Jefferson Memorial, you can you can thank love, whiskey, and adrenaline, and Dr. Takamine. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that was wonderful. That was so wonderful. I'm sorry that uh, uh, um, we don't have the audience here to applaud. I'm just going to have to do it for them. Thank you so much. I love that story. Um, 
Um, so what, what, what was the biggest surprise to you about this whole, this whole story? Was there anything in there that um, really stood out to you? Um, I think it was one of the, the biggest challenges I had in actually researching the story was, in fact, uh, Takamine and Carolyn's um, relationship, especially in New Orleans. And separating the, the myth from fact about that was really interesting. I went back, back into the primary sources uh, because the various um, the various reports or secondary reports that I'd, I'd seen from it were like that he was that the rank was a colonel or that he was a union general or he was a confederate general or that uh, Takamine was a prince or he was a nobleman. Um, and it was really hard separating um, fact from fiction. And I basically had to rely on the contemporary newspaper reports at the time, which we I now know is absolutely was influenced by uh, how that he was being perceived, how he was being seen in the press. So even even those primary sources were not necessarily completely accurate. Hmm. Okay, um, so we, I know that you teach in Japan. Is this a story that people in Japan know? Do they take credit for this? Yeah. So um, you could you could definitely um, call him the Thomas Edison of Japan. And there's a lot of parallels there. He was, uh, he was a genius. He used patent law basically to his benefit and the detractors of his opponents. Um, and uh, and he sort of, of course, and he's incredibly famous in Japan. There's even a, a movie about, about his life, which I can't get here because it's, um, it's only available in Japan. Um, so this is someone who's kind of definitely more famous in his homeland than, than he is here. And this is motivating me in telling the story because I can see the story more people need to know. I'm, I'm sorry that last little bit cut off, but it's a it's a great story, and I think I think that's what I'm you saying. Were... It's a great story. I wish I wish more people would know about it. Oh, absolutely, 100 percent. Um, <clears throat> so, um, are you are you um, interacting with the uh, the folks in Japan still? I know you were starting to set up an emergency medicine residency in in uh, Palestine. Yes. Yeah. So. Okay, so there's a lot, lot, lot there. Uh, so yeah, I, I've traveled to Japan um, a couple times, and I was doing some teaching in Osaka. We have one of our trainees. I'm, I'm the um, head of a residency program in at the University of Iowa, and we have one of our graduates who's now living in Okinawa, and he uh, helped start a hospital there in Okinawa. So I would definitely look forward to going back and helping out and teach there. And I was all set to it until until COVID hit, so I just kind of have to wait till that, that that goes by. But yes, in addition to that, I've also been asked to help set up a residency training program in Hebron in the West Bank. Um, and I've got together a uh, group of uh, volunteers, some students, and some other doctors who want to teach ultrasound. So we uh, managed to get uh, some donations together. We managed to get a couple of of small portable ultrasounds donated. Um, raising funds for that, and uh, we're looking forward to going back and teaching and giving these ultrasound machines to the ER in in Hebron uh, for the Palestinian people. But uh, again, we that's going to have to wait till the pandemic's over. Well, um, you're still taking donations for that, though, right? You're still taking donations for the ultrasounds. That's right. I, I am. We, I can be happy to. Uh, I'll share the GoFundMe page with uh, with you guys. Oh, so you please can share, do. Uh, Please do. Is there a search that we can uh, have folks do in the meantime until we can put up the link? Oh, uh, well, if you go to GoFundMe and you search uh, EM ultrasound, emergency medicine ultrasound, or ultrasound Palestine, both ways you'll be able to find it right away. Okay, good. I sure hope that anybody watching contributes to that. Um, Dr. House does really great outreach um, all over the world, and uh, and this is a very important place to have emergency medicine uh, uh, training in, in Palestine. Um, so... Uh, the uh, one of the questions that we had was um, that someone was a little confused on the um, um, ephedrine adrenaline connection and uh, synthesizing mm -hmm. adrenaline from ephedrine, or was it just that the structures were similar? What was the what was sorry? The I, I didn't explain that well. Yeah, so epinephrine is the chemical that's in the human body in the adrenal gland that is responsible for raising blood pressure, increasing heart rate, etc. Ephedra from the ephedra plant. Uh, is a chemical that does a very similar thing because it has a very similar chemical structure. 
the graduate student who Takamine was working with, he was very, uh, he was very experienced with working with the ephedra plant and the stimulant that's in that. Uh, and through his knowledge of that, he was able to then synthesize the epinephrine from, from the human uh, adrenal gland. Okay, um, so we have another question here. Um, do you think a lot of these bursts of genius had something to do with the times? I, I'm, I'm not. Well, uh, I'm not sure with it. if if Takamine hadn't hadn't done it, would somebody else have? Sure. And the reason we know Takamine's name is because, it, not necessarily because he did it first, but that he gets the credit through the process that we have to encourage science through the patent process. So the patent process allows scientists to make money off their inventions. And even though he wasn't necessarily the first person to actually isolate epinephrine or even, you know, discover it, he wasn't. But he was the first one to actually, you know, identify a pure substance and then pro patent the process. And since he got credit for that patent, that's why, that's why he became um, wealthy and famous and everybody in Japan knows his name. Yeah, and, and he also had worked as a patent clerk in two different uh, locations, and so he was not only uh, in the right place, but at the right time for him. He, he He's a good example of playing the long game, and as I, as I kind of elucidated, you know, and kind of foreshadowed the story, is that there's multiple places along the lines where he he studies this patent law. He studies this fermentation process, and you know, and this is something that he's going to apply later on in his in his career. Okay, let's see. Are there any other? We are still taking questions in the line. I don't see any new ones coming up just yet. But um, um, the uh, yes, uh, no new questions just yet. Um, but. Uh, as far as uh, emergency medicine goes, I know that you're also uh, toxicology and, or, or excuse me, um, uh, infectious disease you're, is very much your, your interest as well. Uh, and did, did uh, an actual special rotation in England on uh, years ago on, in, uh, in, in uh, was infectious disease, was it? So my, uh, I've been trained in, in internal medicine and emergency medicine, and I did a, degree program at the University of College of London where uh, epinephrine was first identified <laughs> uh, and that was the London School of Tropical Medicine and so my academic interest has always been emerging infectious diseases and travel related diseases so 2020 has been a pretty big year for me. Oh, has <laughs> there been something? Is, kind of, has, is there something going on? There's something I'm, going on. It's yeah, that kind of brings those kind of things together. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, this is actually the first time that I, ha I have not lectured about COVID in the last like six months. So um, <laughs> thank you for the, give me a break. <laughs> You're that. welcome. But I, I, um, it's it, it's absolutely it's a fascinating disease. I know it is terrible. Uh, it is, is ruining the economy. It's ruining everyone's travel. It's the fact that we're even having DriverCon virtually is an awful, awful disease. And I hope it, um, I hope we, we get control of it soon. Uh, but I gotta tell you from somebody who studies this stuff all the time, um, it's kind of hard not to get geeked out about how amazing and how remarkable, um, some of this, uh, some of the diseases and how it's evolved and how it's, uh, it's found an ecological niche within the world that's really made an, an amazing impact on humanity. First, first really such a significant impact in almost a century. Yeah. So um, there, there was another uh, request for clarification. Um, uh, you said earlier that you, he patented epinephrine, but then you mentioned in your description of, or explanation of something else that you patent that he patented the process. So let, me, let me clarify. It, it was it was both, and that that's that's a point. So he patented the process for for uh, isolating it. So a okay, and nobody had a problem with that. That was not part of the lawsuit at all. It was like there's no question that that he clearly demonstrated the steps for isolating it. He described that he got that patent. But the controversy where the challenge came was he also patented the actual substance itself. I'm discovering this substance, epinephrine, which it exists. It's a natural substance. It's in the body. Um, and he's saying that, he, that he's patenting that actual 
um, substance. And that's what uh, that's what uh, Judge Hand and, and the American legal system allowed him allowed him to do, and then led everybody to do for for another hundred years until Mary Genetics, I guess, took it too far and managed to reverse things for it. Hmm. For it. So uh, was the original source of the epinephrine pigs or what, what animal were they getting them from? Uh, the first one was dog. Dog. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Laura Ross wants to know, are there any books that you can read about Takamine? Ooh, you know, actually, um, not really, <laughs> which is too bad. Um, I've cobbled uh, this story actually from a couple of different sources um, that I was reading and, I, and it was kind of, it, it was kind of a footnote backstory in, in, in one, in one uh, book I was reading. I said, oh, that's really interesting. I want to know more, more about that. And I've actually kind of pulled this story together by looking at a bunch of different sources. So in the American literature, in the English literature, there's not a lot on, on him. Um, there is, if you, do, if you do a Google search on his name, um, there is a PDF that's put out by his foundation that he, that he created about kind of historical documents that, um, that has a kind of a, a bet, best kind of biography that, that I've seen, that, that, well, it's rather dry. I think one of the best books on it is called, and I remember, I remember, I recommend this to Angie, and I'm trying to remember the name of the, dr the, name of the, uh, the book. The Drunken Botanist. Yes. Well, The Drunken Botanist is fantastic. That's a great book. And that is basically just systematically going through like every plant that humans have used to get drunk, which turns out <laughs> is a lot of plants because it's humans have been that for like millennia. Um, and there's a history of bourbon, um, Oh, I can't remember the name of it now, but it's. Uh, but the, I'll I'll try to find the I'll find the name and send to you, send it to people so they can distribute it. But there's a there's a history of of um, of bourbon that uh, describes this pretty, this story pretty well. And that's where most of the information about Peoria comes from. Okay, um, we're still open for questions. Anything? So, oh, 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 I'm seeing some dots, some floaty dots. No, nothing new. So, <laughs> got my hopes up there for a second. Um, so, uh, um, what's oh, the... I got it. another Another one I can recommend is Proof, the Science oh, yes. of Booze by Adam Rogers. Proof, the Science of Booze by Adam Rogers. And that has a whole chapter about, um, about Takamine. And uh, it's, it's, so you can understand, like, basically step-by-step, -step, like, the chemistry of what goes into you know, the the bottle that you drink. Yeah, there are lots of cultures that do still the chewing the the grain or the whatever that still do that. The um, in South America there are still some cultures that do that. So is it sanitary truly? The alcohol kills it. Well, all. sure. <laughs> Get it, distill it, right? So it's going to ferment. Doesn't that make it better? Oh, All the alcohol hope. kills the bacteria, maybe? One would hope. <laughs> I'm not going to be enjoying it. Certainly not in this day. Not, not in the current COVID era. I'm not going to enjoy it. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, so, yeah, we've really, we've really had to adjust everything. Um, I hope you're able to. I know that you're, you're planning. We, we, we fit you in early on the schedule because I knew that you were going to be um, out of contact with the rest of the world here for the next few days. So I'm, I'm sorry you won't be able to see the rest of the feed, but, um, but we've got some really wonderful talks coming up. Um, um, is there any other uh, uh, thing that you need to add to your, to your uh, besides the GoFundMe page? Do you have any other, any causes that you wanna promote or discuss or any kind of other promotional? Uh, no, no, that moments. I give folks a, mo a plug, <laughs> you know, shameless plug, plug moment. I, I will, I will distribute the, uh, the, the, the ultrasound uh, link. That'd be fantastic, and I appreciate that. I am going to um, unplug for the weekend um, and uh, and not turn on electronic for a couple of days, so I can not think about COVID for at least, at least for a day or two. But <laughs> uh, but then I'll be back to it next week. Um, I'm here in Iowa City, where we have uh, currently the highest rate of new cases in the world. I'm mm. very proud to say. So we're number one. We're number one. Yay. Mm. Um, and uh, that is mostly in our college students who are young and healthy and has not affected the community and not affected the hospitalization rate at all yet. Um, but probably about two weeks or so after that big spike happens is when you start to see some of the community involvement, some of the older people that I get get exposed as secondary cases, and those are the patients who end up in the uh, in the hospital, I end up in the ICU, and so that coincides coincides to about uh, Tuesday or Wednesday next week, 
which happens to be my next night shift, so I, I have that to look forward to. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sorry about that. I'll be I'll be doing night shifts starting a few days after that, so we'll see. Yeah, Labor Day weekend two weeks later is going to be really rough. I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> so anyway, well, thank you so much for joining us. I don't see any other questions in the chat room, um, and uh, anybody, uh, um, anybody else uh, you want to you want to have anybody look into or uh, have any other recommendations for reading. Uh, no, thank you very much for having me today. It's been great, and I look, looked into your schedule. I, I, uh, I might break my, um, might break my my electronic silence for a couple of those those, those sessions. Uh, I thought the one on kept to gaming. I thought I was right up my alley, so I, mean, <laughs> I might I might check out that. That's one. right. You usually go to Gen Con. You did. You hosted a Gen Con uh, uh, gaming online. How did that go? I did. I did. I, I I've actually I've actually never. Um, I've actually never been to, 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 to Dragon Con, so thank you for having me uh, in virtually for the first time. Uh, but I usually go to Gen Con in Indianapolis, and I, that's, a, that's our thing every year. Um, and this year, of course, that had to be virtual as well. But I did host a uh, game, uh, a Gen Con online game uh, at, from my home using like four different cameras and stuff, and I put a game out on Zoom that worked out pretty well. Oh, that's good to hear. Well, I hope you have a wonderful trip. Thank you so much for sharing uh, that story with us. It's really, it, it's worthy of James Burke's connections. It was so, so riveting. So, so thank you very much. We hope to have you back when we're live, like in Meet Space. Um, thank you again to Calico Cove and Mark Ditzler for, for uh, hosting us. Um, and um, it looks like we're going to be ending a few minutes early, but thank you everyone for joining us. We'll see you back at one o'clock for Thanks. Uberjit uh, Chanda's talk on Ayurvedic medicine. I'll look behind the curtain and we will see you then. Bye-bye. As fun as all this streaming content is, we sincerely cannot wait to see you all in person again next year. Remember to stay healthy and safe until then. Wear a mask when interacting with other people out in the real world. Want more Skip Track? Get more than 10 years of Skeptics Track programming at our video archive, video.skeptrack.org.